One of uh, the causes of viral hepatitis in pregnant mothers is Hep B. Its importance lies on uh, perpetuation the transmission. Uh, if the antigen is positive, risk of transmission is high, as high as 90%. But we have good, uh, th this risk could be minimized almost near zero if adequate uh, measures are taken. Mainly if the viral load is high, mothers should be treated with uh, antiviral starting at 32 weeks. And all uh, infants born should receive heavy immunoglobulin HB at birth and uh, hep C immunization series at day one, one month, and six months. That literally eliminates the risk of transmission. Uh, is that just like despite viral load? Yeah, absolutely. Despite, if the higher the viral load, you, uh, it, it, will, it will cut down to about 7%. Uh, but if patients have high viral load, over 200,000, the transmission will be higher, and treating it will minimize it, and doing this as well to zero, near zero. I mean, uh, the other is Hep C. It's very uncommon to have vertical transmission, even uh, by sexual intercourse. The risk of transmission is very low. Uh, but the risk is high if IV, uh, HIV infection, drug use, and there is no any specific recommendation what to do in Hep C, uh, especially changing the mode of delivery like CS or, or the like. So the other viral hepatitis her herpes simplex, uh, it could be fatal, especially in the third trimester. So if you have any suspicion for herpes, uh, empiric treatment and uh, workup is recommended. Let's move on to uh, GI bleeding. Not very cell bleeding accounts about 100 to 100,000, mostly in uh, older people and self limited. Uh, endoscopy is used about 25% of the time to stop the bleeding. The mortality is high, 14%. And it's remained high despite all these advances over the years. Uh, if uh, admitted for GI bleeding, 11%, three times more if the patient bleeds while in the hospital. Uh, the most important thing in GI bleeding is to find out whether it's red blood or black or brown. That uh, <clears throat> makes you, decides your level of urgency, what to do next. Hematemesis if bleeding is above the ligament of threads. Uh, melanin usually occurs if the bleeding is 200 cc or more. <coughs> Hematochagia, bright red bleeding could uh, be seen in upper GI bleeding in about 11% of cases. These are the cause of GI bleeding. The, the commonest cause is peptic ulcer disease, about 50%, and smothering of uh, the rest. Uh, you have to assess if you see a patient with GI bleeding, uh, assess severity, whether the patient agitated, hypotensive, pale, and some hemodynamic instability and do the basic uh, stabilization measures. And transfusion, I want to uh, highlight that transfusion, uh, liberal versus restricted transfusion. Uh, restricted transfusion has better outcome in all parameters, mortality, hospital length of stay, uh, morbidity, infection, and the likes. So, so between the goal should be between seven to eight in all patients, except whom, someone whom you think is actively <coughs> bleeding, Mm, or someone has cardiac, cardiovascular dysfunction, coronary artery disease, that you may uh, increase the threshold for that. I mean, lower the transfusion threshold, hemoglobin 8. Uh, P you start PPI, GI consult, and surgical consult could be considered. If uh, cirrhotic, always antibiotic. You will be asked in your boards. Any cirrhotic with GI bleeding, antibiotics. Uh, very cell bleeding, uh, very develop uh, at a rate of 5 to 15 percent per year, and uh, at 30 percent will bleed at some point in patient's life. Uh, bleeding is usually happens if the gradient pressure is over 12 millimeter, but consider clinically significant uh, portal hypertension if the pressure is 10 or low. it might develop ascites and the like. Mortality from very cell bleeding between 15 to 30 percent. In hospital mortality could be assessed 40 percent. Uh, two week after two weeks survival, if patient survives after GI bleeding, 
is about 50% of one year. Treatment is antibiotic, intravenous, octreotide, argent endoscopy, and as uh, alluded, restrictive transfusion. Tips can be considered in select patients and also evaluate something that might precipitate it, uh, increase in pressure like portal vein thrombosis or <coughs> HCC. Plenty transfusion may be considered, but don't be uh, worried up, don't worry about the INR because INR doesn't reflect more. Even if the INR is 2.3, 2.5, we can still do endoscopy unless it's 6, 7 in the legs. Low GI bleeding uh, occurs about 20 per 100,000. Mortality is lower than upper GI bleeding. Mostly the source is colon. And as I, I just discussed, uh, it could come from the upper GI as well. This is uh, most the distribution where uh, you can find uh, the bleeding. The commonest cause is diverticulosis, accounting of almost a third of lower GI bleedings, followed by colon cancer or polyps. IBD infection and ischemia account for about 18%. AVMs also have significant, play significant, especially with now uh, LVARs, AVMs have, uh, we're seeing more and more commonly. Uh, let's touch each one of, a uh, couple of them uh, briefly. Diverticular bleed occurs in through 15%. It could cause massive bleeding in our sias, half of the patients. It's called by erosion of, uh, uh, it's arterial bleed. That's why AV, um, diverticular could, bleeding could be uh, severe. It's painless bleeding, mostly on the right colon. Also, the only 25% of uh, the diverticular occur on the right side of the colon. Persistent bleed could occur <coughs> in 20%. Most stop spontaneously. There is a risk of re-bleeding. Uh, treatment is endoscopy. If it fails, you may ask your IR colleagues to do uh, arteriography and embolization. Surgery should be considered if patient persistent bleeds or patient has several recurrent bleedings. Patient lives alone at home, and you may factor in several factors uh, to refer to surgery. AVMs uh, prevalence about one percent in screening colonoscopy. It could be multiple. Uh, only about ten percent uh, bleed. Most of the time, they cause slow bleeding in patients present with iron deficiency anemia. Uh, treatment, octreotide in acute setting, endoscopy. If you're not able to get rid of all the AVMs, long-acting octreotide could be considered, but it's uh, costly. Uh, most insurance wouldn't approve it. Iron supplementation and regular transfusion may be the only way out you have in AVMs which persistently bleed. Ischemic colitis because of low flow state. Patients with several comorbidities could cause uh, <coughs> the symptom ischemia. Usually they have abdominal pain and bleeding. Diagnosis established by uh, imaging or if you do endoscopy, you may see some inflammation and ulcers. Treatment is IV fluid rest and improve oxygenation and correct work out for coagulopathy because ischemic uh, uh, thrombosis could account for significant proportion of ischemia. Most people get better in a day or two uh, and completely resolve this in two weeks. About a fifth of patients could have chronic uh, sequelae uh, causing strictures, recurrent bacteremia, and protein-losing enteropathy. Uh, special consideration, always you know, develop the habit of asking uh, any vascular <coughs> surgery in patients who come with GI bleeding. Triple A, uh, ortho, diurnal, or ortho enteric fistula could occur about uh, 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 500. Other intra abdominal sources, splenic uh, uh, rupture, retinal peritoneal bleeding should also be considered. Uh, surgical consultation should be sought for these two, as well as for any bleed which GI couldn't control it. Tips for refractory, aside, uh, refractory bleeding uh, also should be considered. Let's do a couple of questions. 65-year-old male with end-stage heart failure in AFib after multiple prior MIs has continuous flow LVAD. He is discharged on aspirin 
Omeprazole and digoxin and coumadin, but these are readmit three months later with symptomatic anemia, hemoglobin 6.8 MCV. Painless private bleeding is noted. His prelate count is 196. INR is therapeutic. Which of the following the most likely source of his bleeding? Ischemic colitis, peptic ulceration, <coughs> AVM, congestive hepatopathy. A, B, C, yeah, mm, AVMs, yeah. AVMs are, I know most of you have rotated in Jewish. It's fairly common to see uh, GI bleeding with secondary to AVMs in patients who have elvad. 72 year old male on 81 milligram of aspirin for secondary prophylax after MI two years ago in presence with hemodynamic having <coughs> significant upper GI bleeding. His aspirin is held and it goes urgent in endoscopy. Uh, with PPI on board and found to have actively bleeding gastric ulcer. Hemostas achieved with epi injection and placement of clips. Which of the following statement with aspirin therapy is correct? His aspirin should, should not be restarted. His aspirin should be restarted after repeat injury documents healing of the ulcer. His aspirin should be restarted in five days. He should be switched to Kumadi. A, B, C, D, so mm, yeah, the answer is C. D, there is no reason why you should be placed on Coumadin. Mm. A, aspirin, he had it, this could have been okay if someone who is taking aspirin for no, for primary prophylaxis, like somebody who is 50 and older, maybe diabetes, you just you recommend aspirin. This would have been Right, but this guy is taking aspirin after an MI, so he needs the aspirin. So he should be started as early as possible. Usually five days is okay. And you don't need to confirm because it's kind of weighing the risk and benefits of uh, uh, resumption of the treatment. Mm. Let's, uh, let's go to the <clears throat> complications of cirrhosis. Mm. There are several complications of cirrhosis. We'll touch about the commonest ones, the top three, but you may kind of review hepatorenal syndrome and hepatopulmonary syndrome, portopulmonary hypertension. Ascites is the number one complication of cirrhosis. Uh, if one lives 10 years after diagnosis of cirrhosis, 50% will have ascites. Uh, mortality is 50% at two years after developing ascites. Cirrhosis, if someone asks you, I have, I have cirrhosis, how, how, I, how long am I going to live, or all that, um, liver disease. If the patient does not have complication, 10-year mm, mortality is just 1%. People could live with cirrhosis for years and years if they don't have complication. But if they start to develop <coughs> complication, that's when uh, the mortality mm, worsens like 50% are two years after ascites, and it may be even 60, 70% if they have very cell bleeding. Uh, the ascites could be uh, classified in portal hypertensive related or non-portal hypertensive related. If you have an ascetic fluid, just the most important things you do is albumin, total protein, cell count to rule out uh, SPP, and you know, serum albumin. So serum Ascites albumin gradient, if it's, it's an arithmetic difference between uh, serum albumin and ascetic fruit albumin. If it's over one point, it suggests portal hypertension. These are the potential differential diagnosis, cirrhosis, heart failure, but carry. Differentiation between the two is cirrhosis almost always have low protein, while the rest have high protein. So that's the distinctive factor, just ballpark. Now, portal Relative ascites have low SAG, uh, less than 1.1, and these are the differential like peritoneal carcinomatosis, biliary. So you differentiate uh, among this. You, you, you need more and more information to differentiate whether if it's pancreatic ascites, amylase will be in thousands, uh, and other features of the disease entity itself. Treatment involves uh, the most, the corner story is uh, salt, salt restrictions, two gram sodium diet and diuretics and large volume paracentes. It can be done on a weekly basis, but if the patient has persistent kidney injury and unable to tolerate diuretics, then 
tips could be considered. Excuse me. Uh, tips for refractory assay. What what do we mean by refractory assay? If the patient does not respond after maximum, we consider maximum dose of diuretics less six of one sixty and aldactone of four hundred. Or if the patient develops hyponatremia or acute kidney injury while on diuretics. If that's the case, you may consider tips, provided that you have to check these points, melt less than 18, bilirubin less than 3, and good right-sided heart function, and no significant encephalopathy. Patients might have encephalopathy, but control with lack flows, doing well for, you know, months, years, he may still be a candidate. So this is how they do tips. They access the hepatic vein through the jugular vein, press put a needle, press guide wire, and deploy this catheter. So literally communicating the portal vein to the hepatic vein. This essentially shunts mm, about 30% of uh, portal flow, minimizing the pressure. But that is at a cost that, that's why you want, you want to have a good liver function. If you divert about 30% of blood portal blood flow, which is rich in nutrients and also has oxygen, that might lead to liver failure if the patient does not have fairly good baseline liver function. That's why you, you want uh, uh, bilirubin to be low and fairly good liver status. Uh, contraindication, there are some contraindications. You may not be, you, you won't be asked, but if somebody has, uh, to, we don't do tips to prevent varicell bleeding. Uh, a patient has congestive heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, infection, all that, these are some contraindications. SPP uh, is one of the complications of uh, ascites. It's about 20%, about 15% mortality. About 50% of patients will have bacteremia at diagnosis. That's why prompt diagnosis and treatment is recommended. Diagnosis, culture is hard to get culture because of transport, the collection techniques, all that. Uh, but we use payments if 250 or above, that will make the diagnosis of uh, SPP. And you treat accordingly with ceftriaxone. You give albumin is recommended to give 1.5 with significant improvement in mortality as well as renal dysfunction. 1.5 per kg on day one. And this has stood, you know, test of time, about 20 years old study that <coughs> still being practiced in. Uh, the other most important thing is if you suspect SPP, don't do therapeutic paracentes. Just take out about few cc of few uh, meals of fluid and test it. Or avoid IV contrast or aggressive diuresis until uh, they improve. A repeat paracentes could be considered if the patient is not getting better in two, three days. Uh, and you expect improvement in payments by 25%. If that's the case, you may switch treatment to oral. Outpatient treatment can be considered. SPP responds very, very well to treatment. You don't need to treat even four days. Even five days treatment could suffice. Uh, prophylaxis is recommended in standard of care. Once patients are diagnosed of SPP, lifelong prophylaxis after f- in hepatic, I don't go into about the pathophysiology and all that, but the treatment might be asked. Lack load it still has and has been for years and years and very effective in treating encephalopathy. So you may do rectal enema, uh, rifaximin, zinc, l carnitine could be considered if a patient doesn't get better with the above three. And the other most important thing in uh, encephalopathy is look for triggering cause. It could be dehydration, infection, or GI bleeding, or medication non-compliance and address accordingly. And the other uh, important issue as well is uh, don't be stuck with SPP in, uh, I mean, encephalopathy in cirrhotics. Other things also could cause altered mental status. 21-year-old female is hospitalized with jaundice, myalgias, and malaise. She denies abdominal pain and fever. On exam, she's jaundiced, but has no stigma of chronic liver disease. Her mental status is clear. She has a history of new drug use or alcohol abuse, but admits regular cocaine, snorting, and intravenous use. She denied over-the-counter drug use, including NSAIDs or astaminophen. Her laboratories include 
LT310, SC250, BILI, 1, INR, 1.2 alphose, 134, protein sample to albumin. Heavy core IgM is negative, surface antigen is negative, ferritin 1300, NA is normal, HEP A is negative, HEP C antibody is negative as well, astaminophen level is normal. What the most likely diagnosis? Hemochromatosis, serology negative, HEP B, autoimmune hepatitis, acute hepatitis C. Okay, A, B, C, D, yeah, that's right. Well, most of you have got it. It's uh, C. So mm, this ferritin is kind of red hair, hairy. Uh, ferritin is an acute phase reactant. It, it will be universally elevated in most uh, inflammatory conditions of the liver. So you shouldn't put your money on that. Serol negative HEP is essentially excluded if you have core negative and surface antigen negative. So acute hepatitis is essentially excluded. Chronic, not maybe not, but we don't go into that. But that's not the case. Autoimmune hepatitis, you know, there's no any, any reason to suspect that. NA is also normal. So acute hep C, the point of this question is, hep C, the, she has history of IV drug use, young. Mm, it could be negative. Antibody takes about 8 to 12 weeks, some month to month immune response for hep C. So if you suspect hep C in acute setting, you should check for RNA. 27-year-old uh, female states she ingested two handfuls of extra strength astaminophen tablet after argument with her boyfriend, then brought herself to AR for evaluation. Exam is normal. AST 265, LT 370, BLE 1, ALK 134, albumin 3.4, INA 1.2, protein 7.5. High stamina of 11.45. What are program are at this point? Discharge from ER with follow-up because her uh, Romac Matthew normogram does not predict hepatitis. Immediate NAC, transfer to liver transplant center, immediate pure charcoal. Okay, A, B, C, D. Okay, I think most of you have got it right. Yeah, NAC. Saves life. It's very, very effective for uh, astaminophen induced, or for that matter, most um, drug induced liver injury. You don't want to discharge her from the ER. This Romar Matthew normogram predicts liver toxicity, someone with normal liver enzymes. So we see she already developed liver toxicity. So this wouldn't, it's not useful anymore because this is someone who has ingested, but you want to predict. Uh, the chance of them having liver toxicity. Uh, transfer is premature. She is conscious. There is no any uh, <coughs> liver failure or impending liver failure at this point. Pure charcoal would have been considered has she shown up about within four hours of injection. Six hours is too late. <coughs> A 52 year old male with decompensated cirrhosis from hep C presents with severe ascites. He's currently taking less 6, 120 mg oral daily, spiralactone 200 mg daily, lactulose 30 cc three times daily. Despite his adherence to lactulose, he gets confused. His serum creatinine is 2.1, serum sodium 125, total bilirubin 4.2, and INR 1.9. Which therapy is most appropriate? Increase uh, less 6 to 160 and spiralactone 300, serial large volume paracentes with albumin, tips, abdominal catheter for continuous training. Okay, A, B, C, D. Okay, when you are, uh, the, the answer is B. When, when you have a, any doubt in questions to pick between two, go back to the question and look for contraindication to exclude one or the other. Tips wouldn't be an option. It's, it could be considered in this case because the patient has poorly controlled encephalopathy. On top of that, his bilirubin is 4. You, you don't want to do tips to someone whose bilirubin is over 3. It, you may do it, but generally for test exam, uh, you, 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 you want a good liver function to do tips. And he's poorly controlled encephalopathy. Uh, you, you're not going to increase the 
diuretics because his creatinine is 2.1. Abdominal catheter is not an option for tip. That's always wrong because it's a matter of time to get infected and maybe kind of facilitate patient's uh, demise. Uh, let's go to the next. Okay. Uh, you admitted a patient to the intensive care unit with hematomas who has history of cirrhosis. He's not on home medication. His mm, physical exam shows blood pressure of 90 over 60 heart rate. His characters, abdominal exam, he has aside splenomegaly. Labs reveal hemoglobin 11. Prele count 78. White count 5000. Creatinine 1.6. Berry 1.6. AST 68. INR 1.6. Album 3.4. ER consulted GI. Uh, EGD revealed large various and six various are bonded. He started on intravenous octreotine and pantoprol. Which of the following should be recommended? Transfuse, two units of PRBC, transfuse fresh, fresh frozen plasma, city of the abdomen, ceftriaxone. A, B, C, D. Yeah, this will definitely be appear in your uh, board exam. So antibiotics are recommended. Transfusion, hemoglobin 11, you don't even think about that, let alone 11, 11 even if it's 8. Uh, FFP, you hardly give FFP unless the patient actively bleeding and INR is maybe 3, 4. So you can, CT wouldn't be considered, his, there's no reason to do, even if you have reason to do, his creatinine is 1.6. Uh, a patient with new onset ascites but no known history of liver disease has fallen portal pressure. Wage hepatic pressure 25, free hepatic 6, the most likely cause of this patient. We didn't go over, I don't know your city, this, but mm, the most likely etiology is this is the gradient is 25 minus 6, 19. So, right heart scalar. Extra hepatic portal veins, thrombos, liver, cirrhosis, but carry. A, B, C, D. Okay. So it's liver cirrhosis. He has gradient. The free hepatic pressure is normal, 6. But the wedge pressure indicates the portal. It's a proxy for the wedge pressure. Let me uh, have a thing. Let me go over this. Portal pressure gradient is um, wants to assess portal hypertension, hepatic vein, vein portal gradient, the free hepatic minus the waged. So normal is under five. Anything above five is abnormal. What they do is they just go through the um, uh, internal jugular and go measure the free hepatic end, put the catheter deep in the as deep as into the hep the hepatic venules to measure sinusoidal pressure. That's the wedge pressure, which is a proxy to the portal pressure. So here, wedge pressure six, free hepatic two, the difference is four, which is normal. Uh, 38 year old alcoholic presents with neonset ascites, diagnostic parameters reveal cloudy fluid with total protein 1.5, SAG 1.6, cell count 350, the most likely etiology of the ascites is alcoholic cirrhosis, cardiomyopathy, lymphoma, peritoneal carcinomatosis. A, B, C, D. Okay. It's uh, alcoholic cirrhosis because SAG is one high SAG, low protein. Cardiomyopathy would have high SAG or high protein. Lymphoma. A cloudy uh, fluid is to for you to suspect chylus ascites, but alcoholists could have some chylus ascites in about 10% of cases. Right, let's go. Okay. Let's uh, go over quickly on uh, diarrhea. I think we have maybe five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, generally, you uh, try to classify diarrhea into pathophysiologic mechanisms, osmotic, secretory, inflammatory, motility. That helps in, gets you all the possible causes of diarrhea. But what I, I would like you to 
focus some clues in the question stem where you'll be asked. Usually it might be difficult to remember all this, but before the exam you want to go over them. Uh, small volume uh, with tenesmus usually suggests colonic or distal colonic origin. If it's large in volume, mostly over a liter, um, watery urgency is small bowel origin. If it's large, foul, small, uh, foul smelling and greasy, suggests malabsorption. It could be pancreatic insufficiency or malabsorption. If the patient has pain in the periumbilical area, small bowel origin is most likely. If it's in lower abdomen, maybe colonic origin. Blood suggests invasive organisms like Salmonella, Campylobacter. Hmm. Effect of fasting could be uh, you know, stuck in the question stem that the patient hasn't. You'll see it in your experience as with patients who have diarrhea, will be in the hospital, they are not eating anything, and they won't have any, no stool even to do, stool test. So it could be effect of fasting. There's no, uh, it stops if it's osmotic or allergic and continues if it's inflammatory uh, secretive. Nocturnal diarrhea suggests uh, organicity. There are some food items which are linked to board uh, writers like to put in under poultry, salmonella, campylobacter, the ground beef. So you may want to go over these specific uh, associations. Mm. The other uh, histologic clue, um, mark and whipple differentiation. In mark, acid fast bacilli, it's, uh, it's an acid fast bacilli, while uh, trophenema whipple is not. So that's the only distinction between that. Otherwise, they look like uh, the same clinically as well as uh, endoscopically on biopsy. Uh, flagship ulcers, ameba, all CMV, could be an immunocompromised patient with... Uh, biopsy showing this, uh, the same thing in HSV. CDF will be tested as well, but the most important, mostly the, what uh, they ask is the treatment, vancomycin mm, for CV disease. Even now, these days, most practitioners resort to vancomycin, anyone who is hospitalized. But in, in board exam, if you are asked mild disease, go for uh, metronidazole. If they have uh, fulminant disease, colitis, VANC, both oral and rectal, as well as uh, IV flagellate should be considered. IVIG could be considered in, in disparate situations if you are not able to control the inflammation. And uh, eventually, surgery might be uh, the, the option. If you have relapses, you might be at this uh, FMT, I think, will find its way into the boards now. Mm, people several recurrence because it's so dramatic that uh, complete, it completely stops in a couple of days after a uh, fecal transplant. Those who have who failed vancomycin taper. Uh, this is monoclonal antibody uh, believed to prevent or reduce uh, chance of recurrence. Uh, so this, uh, let, let's do one, this question and then we'll, we'll stop. So you are a physician in a cruise ship in the Caribbean. At midnight, there is an oriental buffet. At 3 a.m., a passenger comes to you to your office complaining of abdominal cramps and nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Over the next two hours, another 72 points are waiting to be seen. What the most likely cause of the illness? Clostridium perfringis, uh, enterotoxigenic E. coli, bacillus serous, rotavirus, enterohemorrhagic E. coli. A, B, C, D, okay, yeah, this is very common cause. Reheated rice that might specifically spell out like that, or this is in a way that. And the duration, preformed toxin within six hours, it got to be bacillus serous or staph aureus. Close range perfringes like com canned food, and usually it, it, it's within 14 hours. It's not that acute. Rotavirus is a cause, but it takes any, any uh, viral or bacterial has to establish infection to cause, uh, like it takes at least minimum 14 hours, usually days. Uh, so that's the uh, most likely cause. Okay, thank you for your attention. I appreciate for coming. Uh, if you have any questions, happy to entertain.